visible, sir? Yes, sir. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, today, I will be presenting about the venous uh, physiological assessment and duplex scanning. So, as we all know, the symptoms of venous diseases vary from just edema and pigmentation to large non healing ulcers and debilitation. While almost 80% of the treatment is conservative, about 20% undergo surgical procedures. Venous diseases of the lower limb mainly involve chronic venous insufficiency due to varicose veins or post phlebitic changes. Primary and secondary chronic venous diseases lead to reflux or obstruction, or more commonly, both. The physiological testing that we do is to identify, grade, and follow venous insufficiency and to define DVT. The goal of physiological testing is to provide accurate information describing hemodynamic or anatomical characteristics of such diseases. We all know that the venous system in the lower limb consists of three interconnected systems, the superficial, deep, and operating system. Blood flows from superficial to deep, except at the ankle, and towards the right side of the heart, aided by respiration, the muscle pump, and unidirectional valves. The muscle pump effectively reduces the pressure in the superficial system. These three components of the venous system are subjected to a hydrostatic pressure, which is the weight of the column of blood from the heart to the ankle. In a tall weight, it may be as much as 90 millimeters of mercury. The deep waves withstand this pressure much better than the superficial system, and the valves keep the blood in a unidirectional flow, the failure of which leads blood to flow down and out along the pressure gradient. In healthy veins, as we said, the flow is towards the right side of the heart and from the superficial to the deep system. The muscle compartments contract during ambulation and con upward and forward. Transient pressures in the deep venous system may be recorded as high as five atmospheres during strenuous activity. This pumping action, secondary to ambulation, has an effect of reducing superficial system pressure. The pathological mechanism of chronic venous diseases, as we said, are most commonly a combination of both reflux and obstruction. The interrelationship between reflux and obstruction is not clear, and pure obstruction without reflux can also occur and is seen in about 30% of limbs. Incidental islet vein stenosis may be seen in up to 70% of people, which includes both general and CVD populations. The importance of obstruction in CVD was not appreciated until recently. And currently, there are no reliable functional tests to assess obstruction. Diagnosis of obstruction mainly relies on imaging modalities. Much of the clinical research and focus in the past two centuries has been on the reflux component. You play ultrasound, which is routinely used nowadays, air plethysmography, and ambulatory venous pressure, which is rarely used nowadays in a clinical setting. Ambulatory venous pressure is arguably the most important test as venous hypertension is at the core of chronic venous diseases and its clinical manifestations. Uh, ambulatory venous pressure is defined as the venous pressure in the dorsal foot vein after 10 tiptoe movements in the standing position. Pressures are measured by a needle inserted in the dorsal foot vein through a high frequency transducer mounted at the foot level. The pressure stations are acquired using digital software. The resting pressure is obtained in the erect position with the weight bearing on the opposite limb. Refill time is the time taken for the pressure to return to 90% of the baseline after cessation of calf action. This test is an invasive measure. 
the picture on the right shows both an air plethysmograph and ambulatory venous pressure being measured at the same time. On the right is a normal graph of ambulatory venous pressure where the normal pressure when standing is roughly about 90 millimeters of mercury and the 10 tiptoe movements which brings down the pressure. This is roughly to 25 to 30 millimeters of mercury. The time then taken for the refill to up to 90% of the baseline is the venous refill time. Ambulatory pressure drop is the percentage calculated on the base and venous refilling time is the time in seconds for the venous refill to occur in the veins. Ambulatory venous pressure abnormalities were overwhelmingly associated with reflux and chronic venous disease, but however, not well with obstruction. The lack of fall during exercise indicates that the calf pump is not working well. If the pressure returns to normal very quickly, it indicates either superficial or deep reflux. A rise rather than fall during exercise could indicate the occlusion of the deep veins. Higher the venous pressure, greater the severity of chronic venous insufficiency. Tonicate may be applied to differentiate between superficial and deep reflux. The limitations of this test was that the pressure at the fetal vein may not accurately reflect the leg venous pressure. It is invasive and time consuming. Edema, dermal thickening, inflammation, all obscure fetal veins and prevent cannulation of the vein. Restricted ankle movements and also the presence of ulcers do not allow adequate assessment of calf muscle pump. The next test is plethysmography. This is a non-invasive test and it starts in the supine position and then in the standing position with various maneuvers. The superficial system is occluded with a rapidly deflatable cuff so that the patency and competency can be checked. If a subject's fluid column falls to normal levels during occlusion of the superficial system, the observer knows that the deep system is intact and the superficial system is incompetent. If the fluid column remains elevated with exclusion of the superficial system, the deep system is incompetent. Physiological venous testing is based on these principles. Normal and abnormal recordings show limb volume increase to a plateau with a superficial cuff and then outflow on rapid dictation to this cuff. Venous volume and venous outflow can thus be measured. In outflow obstruction or in venous insufficiency, the venous outflow and venous volume are reduced as seen in the pictures on the right side. Plethysmographs are devices that measure volume change. During the past 50 years, plethysmographs have been developed and used clinically and employ completely different principles. There are currently four types of plethysmographs that are used. Impedance plethysmography, strain gauss plethysmography, photoplethysmography, and air plethysmography. Impedance plethysmography is a non-invasive technique which is used to study change in a physical function as a result of volume change. Blood is a good conductor of electricity. And impedance plethysmography is based on a fundamental principle of electronics, which states that the volume across a segment is equal to the impedance of that segment multiplied by the current flowing through that segment. Impedance is the combined effect of resistance and reactance. Here, a thigh cuff is also used and was primarily used for acute DVT diagnosis. In this test, it is possible to isolate a part of the limb and subject the limb segment to a standard known current when measuring the voltage change across the segment. In practice, 
a circular electrode around the segment of interest, generally at the proximal cuff, and connects the electrodes to an electrical console. The subject is asked to perform a series of maneuvers, and the outputs of the device are recorded. This method has been used by some investigators even to assess venous insufficiency. The test is done with and without a cuff to check the patency of the deep veins or presence of a thrombus. Strain gauge plethysmography measures the circumference of a limb segment which is related to the segmental cross area. The cross sectional area multiplied by the length of the segment will equal the volume. This device is constructed using a small hollow elastic tube filled with mercury and an electrical circuit capable of measuring the voltage across the tubing length. The tube containing mercury is carefully placed around the limb segment of interest and connected to the electrical circuit. The subject is asked to perform a series of maneuvers and the outputs from the device are recorded. As the limb, as segment circumference is changed, Secondary to venous blood volume, the length of the elastic tube also changes. By measuring the circumference as a function of time, venous blood volume as a function of time may also be measured. Initially, it was used for the diagnosis of DVT. The limitations of this method include patients who cannot lie flat, have severe muscle wasting, cardiac failure, and in patients with limb injuries, casts, and bandages. Both these types of plethysmography were mainly used for acute DVT diagnosis in the past and have not been fully validated for the use in chronic venous insufficiency. Photoplethysmography, not a true plethysmograph in the sense because it measures cutaneous microvasculature. The instrumentation includes a surface transducer which is taped to the lower leg above the medial malleolus and is collected to an electrical circuit. Excitation of the transducer is recorded and interpreted by of a returning signal. The transducer is designed with an infrared emitting diode and a photosensor. <clears throat> transducer transmits light to the skin, which is both scattered and absorbed by the tissue in the illuminated field. Blood being more opaque than the surrounding tissue attenuates the reflected signal more than other tissue. The intensity of the reflected light is reduced when there is more blood in the field. If the electrical circuit filters the higher frequency arterial pulsations, it is possible to register a signal which quantitatively corresponds to venous volume in the segment of interest. Absorption of light is high. When venous and capillary blood is increased by sitting or standing, it is decreased during exercise. The patient is asked to do five ankle flexion extension movements and the tracing drop is recorded. The time taken for recovery is recorded as the venous refill time. This is shown in the diagram on the right. Photoplethysmography is a measure of overall physiological function of the venous system. It provides an estimate of the global effect of reflux in the limb and is not a quantitative measurement. And the machine needs to be calibrated and the report varies from lab to lab. Placement near a varicose vein or a perforating vein may also affect the readings. Air plethysmography is more reliable as a quantitative measure of venous insufficiency as we will see. An air cuff is connected to a console via a single rubber tube and any change in limb volume is measured by a pressure change within the bladder. If limb volume increases, the bladder volume will decrease, but the bladder pressure will increase. An air plethysmograph is able to detect changes in venous limb volume secondary to various patient memories. The air plethysmograph is used in the clinical assessment of venous insufficiency and DVT. Physiological parameters related to chronic venous disease, such as chronic obstruction, reflux, muscle pump function, and venous hypertension can all be measured. Air plethysmography accurately separates 
normal limbs from those with chronic venous insufficiency and the parameters like venous filling index, venous volume, ejection fraction and <coughs> residual venous fraction, all of which we will see in the consequence slides, show a significant difference. The limitations of air plethysmography are the inability to be done in patients who cannot stand or do the maneuvers. The range of ankle movement is important. Obesity is a limiting factor in that the cuffs may not fit. These tests also do not give the anatomical site to the class. This diagram shows a comparison between air plethysmography and ambulatory venous pressure measurement where air plethysmography measures volume-related parameters of the calf and ambulatory uh, venous pressure measures pressure-related parameters in axial flow. So, how exactly are these done for venous insufficiency and DVT? Insufficiency is characterized by misdirected flow between the three venous systems. In the supine position, the venous pressure is slightly above the atrium pressure, which is almost zero. On standing, it increases due to hydrostatic pressure of the blood column, as we said, and the uh, pressure in the region of interest will also be increased. First, the testing is done in supine position to check the outflow obstruction and collateralization. Next, very carefully, the patient is made to stand and the filling rate of the veins via reflux of incompetent veins is measured. Tiptoe movement once is then performed and the calf muscle pump function is measured as ejection fraction. Then tip, 10 tiptoe movements are rapidly done to measure the ambulatory venous pressure. Three important parameters need to be defined in plethysmography: the venous filling time, the ejection fraction, and the residual volume. This figure on the left clearly illustrates the venous refill time and the position of the patient. When the patient is supine, the, the pressure is almost zero. When the patient stands, there is a time taken for the venous filling of the veins. At plateauing, the venous volume of the limb can be recorded. And on one tiptoe movement, the ejection volume can be recorded. The 10 tiptoe movements and the lowest pressure recorded is the <clears throat> ambulatory venous pressure and the residual volume can thus be calculated. The venous filling time is the average filling rate of the veins to 90% of the total venous volume after emptying the veins by gravity. It does not rely on calf muscle pump for vein empty. It defines the rate of increase in volume on standing and is slow in normal patients. The venous filling index measures tie to calf reflux only. Perforator reflux has no effect, nor does reflux isolate it to either the calf or the calf. The patient must help in obtaining a clean venous filling index trace by standing up slowly and smoothly without bumping the calf. Remind the patient to relax the muscles and keep the knee slightly bent to prevent popliteal entrapment. This is a good estimate of global function of the lower limb venous system and venous reflux. If it is less than 2 ml per second, the venous refill time can be said to be normal and may take as long as 30 seconds. If it is up to 30 ml per second, it indicates severe venous insufficiency. It can be used as an estimate of disease severity and studies have shown that the possibility of recurrence in ulcers can also be predicted based on the venous refilling time, where if it was more than 4 ml per second, the possibility of recurrence was more and the risk increases by 17% with every one second increase above that. The ejection fraction represents the effic efficacy of the calf muscle pump. It consists of three steps. In the first step, 
the patient applies equal weight on both the legs. The next, the patient does tiptoe using both legs equally without supporting his weight on his hands. The patient remains in the tiptoe or the toe up position for several seconds until an ejection volume is stable and a plateau is reached. Finally, the patient returns to the resting position by removing his weight from the test leg with the toe just touching the floor and the veins will quickly refill. Patients with poor outflow will take longer to expel calf blood with a single toe up movement. If the patient were to perform the toe up exercise quickly, less blood would be ejected past the obstructed vein and the calf pump would appear less repetitive. The possible causes of poor calf muscle pump include non venous problems like arthritis, ankylosis, neurological deficits, proximal obstruction that prevent blood from exiting the veins, incompetent calf perforators that shunt blood from deep to the superficial system, and calf varicosities that retain large volumes of blood. The residual volume fraction is a global measurement related to the severity of disease. It is done after venous filling index testing. Exercise hyperemia resulting from the 10 toe up movements will almost certainly increase the venous filling index and may be mistaken as reflux. After the 10 toe up movements, the veins are allowed to refill while the patient stands in the resting position. Finally, the patient is returned to the supine position with the operator holding the ankle for the test leg up to 45 degrees with the knee slightly bent. This position is held until the ending baseline is reached. The ending baseline may be higher or lower than the baseline value at the beginning of the test. Recently, residual volume fraction testing has been modified by having the patient walk on a treadmill. The effect of the calf muscle pump is a more accurate reflection of ambulating. Treadmill testing better shows the subtle differences in calf pump function found with the use of compression stockings. There are a few. This graph is probably a take home message and we need to know it. Where venous filling index is calculated as 90% of the venous volume divided by the venous filling time. Ejection fraction is ejection volume divided by venous volume into 100. And venous, uh, sorry, residual venous fraction is residual volume by the venous fraction, venous volume as a percentage. If the volume measurements are taken accurately, then patients with reflux in patients with reflux, venous refilling develops secondary to reflux and reduced venous refilling time less than 20 seconds is observed. So a venous refilling time of less than 20 seconds indicates a reflux. If the ejection fraction is greater than 60%, the limb is considered to be normal. Superficial and deep reflux along with DVT will cause a drop in ejection fraction. If the residual venous fraction is above 35%, it indicates venous ambulatory hypertension and should be evaluated further. The deep venous system is not only a conduit for returning blood to the right side of the heart, but also a capacitance system. This means volume changes rapidly relative to pressure. If there is an obstruction in a segment of deep vein, Despite which venous collateral channels, venous pressure distal to the obstruction will increase. Examination by plethysmography makes use of these two principles. A plethysmograph transducer is placed at the calf or distal thigh with the patient lying in supine position on a table. In the case of air plethysmography, the transducer is an air bladder inflated to 5 millimeters of mercury. In case of photoplethysmography, the transducer is a light emitting diode. Proximal to the transducer, a method for rapidly occluding the deep system must be used. All transducers, this can be a thigh cuff, 
inflated rapidly by a hand valve or an automatic inflator. With the transducer recording a stable venous signal at 5 millimeters per second of charge speed, the pressure in the proximal occluding cuff is rapidly elevated to 50 millimeters of mercury. The transducer measuring absolute levels of volume. With the increased pressure in the proximal cuff, the venous blood in the deep system cannot pass under the cuff until the venous pressure reaches approximately the same as that of the occluding cuff pressure. This increase in venous pressure develops because the proximal cuff does not obstruct arterial inflow. After about 20 to 40 seconds, pressure in the distal venous system reaches the pressure of the occluding cuff and venous volume reaches a plateau. Once the plateau has been reached, the operator rapidly releases the pressure of the occluding cuff and the pooled venous blood can then return to the right side of the heart via the larger veins upstream. Two measures of venous hemodynamics are taken during this test. First, there is a volume increase from the baseline to the plateau. This is known as the segmental venous capacitance and represents the blood storage capacity of the segmental vein. This is generally quoted in millimeters of deflection if the system is calibrated through volume. The second measurement is the slope of the volume time curve immediately after the pressure in the occluding cuff is released. This is known as maximum venous outflow. It represents the resistance to blood flow in the deep system. This may be quoted in millimeters of deflection per second or millimeters per second if the system is calibrated to volume. Thankfully, nowadays we have duplex scan. The first, what we will look at is continuous wave Doppler. Basically, Doppler is a sound and it uses an ultrasound frequency range of 5 to 7 megahertz. It can be used both for DVT and for venous insufficiency. To assess DVT using a handheld Doppler, which most of us use, the patient is in standing position and points of interest include common femoral vein and the inguinal ligament, the popliteal vein and the popliteal fossa, and the posterior tibial vein behind the medial malleolus at the ankle. The probe is positioned towards the venous flow at a 60 degree angle to streamline the flow and to get a good velocity of optimized flow. The three diagnostic criteria needed to rule out DVT is the velocity of flow, spontaneous and phasic nature of the signal, and distal augmentation of the signal on compression. Half pain DVT cannot ruled out, cannot be ruled out by this method. When it comes to venous insufficiency, in assessing reflux of the major deep veins, the lower extremity, the procedure is most effectively performed when the subject is standing. To the extent possible, the weight should be shifted to the contralateral limb. Target pains are assessed for reversal of flow by checking the velocity after rapid manual limb compression and release. The more the reversal, the more the reflux there is. In terms of diagnostic criteria, a normal vein demonstrates no evidence of reflux when this technique is used. The next modality is the normal B mode imaging. The probes used here range from 5 to 10 megahertz. However, this will depend on the depth of the vein that needs to be assessed, with higher frequency probes needed for more superficial veins. Blood is not a good reflector of the ultrasound, and hence the vein lumen appear black. Vein walls appear bright and thinner as compared to arteries. Flowing blood may be seen in a vein close to the skin in slow flow conditions and in roule aggregations. Evaluation begins at the groin using grayscale imaging. Usually seen are the common femoral vein, common femoral artery, and the great staphylis vein forming the Mickey Mouse image. As the probe moves distally, the GSP goes out of range, and the common femoral artery divides into superficial and deep femoral artery. The probe continues distally 
and you should focus on keeping the superficial femoral artery and vein in clear view. The popliteal artery and popliteal vein are difficult to visualize in the adductor canal. Therefore, these structures are identified from behind by placing the probe in the popliteal crease. In the calf, the duplicated posterior tibial and peroneal veins with their associated single arteries can be viewed from a medial approach as they travel between the muscle bellies. With the probe, one can compress the vein in a short axis view. The ability to fully compress the vein walls as seen in the picture above and obliterate the venous lumen momentarily confirms vein patency and the absence of thrombus formation. Diagnosis of thrombosis is by visualization of the vein being distended, round and larger than the artery. If one identifies a thrombus, the next step is to determine its age. Acute thrombi are characterized by vein dilatation and non-compressible echodusin material. Chronic thrombi, on the other hand, take on a speckled hyperechoic ultrasonic appearance. Thrombi become more echogenic with age. If from the common femoral vein through to the tibial veins are compressible and no evidence of thrombus is seen, the scan is said to be negative for deep vein thrombosis. These are a few pictures. On the top left is an acute deep vein thrombosis where the vein is non compressible, and on the right is a chronic thrombosis where the vein is partially compressible. There are this table indicates the various features to differentiate an acute from a chronic thrombus. The thrombus appearance either hypoechoic or echogenic, the size and vein wall characteristics where a large thin smooth walled vein with a thrombus may indicate an acute thrombus, whereas the smaller adjacent artery which is thickened, sorry, smaller than the adjacent artery thickened walled vein may indicate a chronic thrombus. In an acute thrombus also, collaterals will be absent and which may be present in chronic thrombosis. Provocative maneuvers like Valsalva need to be used in combination with color flow to differentiate thrombus from erythrocyte aggregates and to confirm patency of the vein. Hence, B-mode ultrasound is not without its limitations. B-mode ultrasound in conjunction with color flow Doppler is what is known as duplex scanning and now routinely used for the diagnosis of deep vein thrombosis. Duplex ultrasound has become the gold standard for the diagnosis of both DVT and venous insufficiency and has replaced many of the other tests. Power color pulse wave Doppler signals with high resolution B mode imaging is now state of the art duplex scanning. The examination should be performed on an examination table in which the patient's lower extremities should be in a slightly dependent position. Duplay ultrasound is not only diagnostic, but it plays crucial roles in other venous procedures like endovenous ablation, ultrasound guided spherotherapy, and the monitoring of the success of vein closure procedures. It is easily available, cheap, does not have any ionizing radiation to the patient and is non-invasive. However, the accuracy and reliability depend on the thoroughness of the examination and is user dependent. The competency of the interpreter is what makes it. <clears throat> In this table, various techniques that should be documented during a proper venous examination have been highlighted. While I would not like to go into the, all the details, a few points which need to be reaffirmed are the proper patient positioning in which the testing should be done in standing and lying down or semi-recumbent position with the, way, with the legs slightly dependent. Measurement of proper vein diameters and also the use of provocative maneuvers to test for reflux. While 
when it comes to documentation, apart from giving grayscale images, Doppler waveforms, velocity measurements, vein diameter, valve closure times, and reflux duration must be mentioned. Superficial reflux must be traced to its source, and the reflux duration should be documented. Color Doppler signals, power Doppler signals, and compression maneuvers, respiratory maneuvers are all used to supplement this procedure if and when necessary. Normal veins have spontaneous flow, which is phasic with respiration. <clears throat> there are various uses of the duplex scan in which it can be used for the diagnosis of DVT in the lower limbs, in the abdomen, and in the upper limbs. In the abdomen, when used to assess the IBC, we require the patients to have a minimum of six to seven hours of fasting so that the bowel gas shadows will be less. The flow in the IBC is very phasic and slightly pulsatile due to the proximity to the heart and also adjacent to the iota. In the upper limb, it is slightly more difficult to assess the most central veins like the subclavian and the brachiocephalic, as these veins are non-compressible since they are behind the clavicle. Superficial thrombophlebitis is also diagnosed by duplex, but more than that, it is also used for follow-up of superficial thrombophlebitis while scanning for thrombite thromb thrombosis of the superficial vein. It is important to let note the length of the segment, the proximity to the SF or the SP junctions, and also to be done again after two weeks in case anticoagulation is not initiated to check the progress or resolution of this condition. Focus or point of care ultrasound is a bedside procedure in which scanning for deep venous thrombosis is done at two points, the inguinal, just below the inguinal crease and in the popliteal fossa. This, while being an accurate bedside test, may not rule out DVT in other segments. Novel ultrasound techniques like elastography to determine tonic venous thrombosis age will be discussed a little later. And the diagnosis of recurrent or the duration of DVT treatment. Uh, when it comes to recurrent deep, deep vein thrombosis, it is very important that the age of the thrombus is characterized because in chronic or post phlebitic limbs, there may be chronic thrombosis which will not be treated with anticoagulation. And hence, it is very important to know whether the thrombus is acute or chronic. Venous mapping for bypass grafting is also important, and the diameter compressibility and the vein walls need to be assessed. We will talk about the evaluation of varicose veins and CVI. When it comes to superficial vein duplex scanning, the examination is mainly done in the erect position and the length of interest is rotated to expose the medial surface from groin and hill and weight is to be shifted to the opposite leg. Scanning begins at the groin as we spoke about the Mickey Mouse landmark in a transverse view and the probe descends down along the course of the great saphenous vein. The saphenofilmoral junction right up to the angle, ankle is enveloped by a superficial fascia above and the muscular fascia below, forming what is called the saphenous eye. Diameter measurements are recorded in millimeters, and the presence of reflux is documented at the junction, slightly below the junction, at mid thigh and below the knee. Reflux is present. The duration of retrograde flow in seconds is also to be documented. Reflux is determined at locations of interest. The color box of the dot of the duplex is adjusted in the measurement location. The velocity scale is adjusted and the signal is obtained. The technologist compresses the calf below the probe in a brisk manner. Vein highlighted in the color box should demonstrate the increase in velocity towards the heart with compression. On release, the vein should demonstrate no velocity 
or a minimal velocity away from the heart. Venous flow away from the heart indicates reflux, and if it lasts between 0.5 to 1 second, is said to be mild, and any reflux over 1 second is said to be severe. When it comes to perforator veins, a cutoff of 0.35 seconds is considered. This is a pictographic diagram showing the great saphenous veins and the points at which reflux is checked. The same evaluation is also repeated posteriorly for the small saphenous vein, and the vein originates distal in the distal calf and can terminate anywhere from the popliteal fossa to the upper thigh. There are variations in superficial venous anatomy. For example, the GSV may either be duplicated or may be small and be complemented by an anterior accessory vein. Some common perforators that play significant roles need to be checked for. The Hunterian perforator in the mid thigh, Dodd perforator in the distant thigh, void perforating vein below the knee or popliteal fossa, and the cockpit perforators above the ankle. The assessment of these must also be part of the workup. Perforators should be assessed regarding diameter, degree of reflux, and extension to other superficial structures. Components of a venous duplex scan for the lower, venous, uh, lower extremity, both for thrombosis and patency, include various segments, as we have spoken about, which must include common femorals, SF junction, proximal femoral, mid femoral, distal femoral, popliteal vein, posterior tibial and peroneal veins. Spontaneous flow, phasity, and flow or augmentation must also be demonstrated. When it comes to reflux testing, uh, again, um, as we have spoken, uh, this chart indicates the various regions in which it must be checked. Upper venous uh, upper limb venous duplex for both thrombosis and patency uh, must be done for both the internal jugular, subclavian, axillary, brachial, basilic, cephalic veins, and additional areas where suspected thrombosis is seen. Vein mapping is the assessment of veins required to see if vein is of a good size greater than 2.5 to 3 millimeters and patency. A novel ultrasound technique, elastography, is used in vascular surgery to determine the age of a thrombus. It uses ultrasound imaging to measure the soft tissue strain to objectively assess the mechanical properties of tissues such as hardness or stiffness. It has been studied as an additional diagnostic modality for characterization of venous thrombosis. Fluids possess volume elasticity, elasticity, that is, they resist changes in volume but not of shape. Solids possess both shear elasticity and volume elasticity, elasticity that is, they resist the changes in both shape and volume. As we all know, stress is the force acting on unit area. Stress may cause stretching and hence length increases and thickness decreases. Strain describes changes in size or shape. Deformational forces produce strain. For a uniform solid, the ratio of stress to strain is a constant. And these are, this is what is called a modulus of elasticity. While not going into details, there are three moduli of elasticity, which is Young's modulus for longitudinal elasticity, shear modulus for rigidity, and bulk or volume modulus for volume elasticity. Compression elastography uses ultrasound imaging with and without probe compression. Areas of interest are evaluated for relative deformation. Less deformation is seen in more rigid tissues of thrombus. Pre-mode imaging in the transverse view, compressibility of the lumen with gentle probe pressure is done. Acute thrombus diameter 
is measured in the anterior posterior diameter before and after compression by freezing the frame. Ultrasound elastography module is activated and a color picture of red, green and blue is obtained in which red indicates stiff areas, green are intermediately stiff areas and blue are soft areas. Stiffness is measured using the elasticity index representing the relative strain value. A visual evaluation of the elasticity index ranges from 0 to 6, where 0 is the hardest and 6 is the softest. This is obtained from these real-time images. This technique enables non-invasive assessment of tissue stiffness in response to an applied mechanical force by detecting differences in biomechanical properties of normal and diseased tissues. What I have said may have been confusing, but it is very clearly visible in the picture here. Once you freeze the frame of a B mode ultrasound, the elastogram code, color coded elastogram is added, and you get a color picture in which the red areas show that there is a uh, stiffness and the blue areas where it is supple. This is then uh, placed on a graph. And in this case, for a thrombus, uh, the it elasticity ranges between four and five, where it indicates that it is probably an acute thrombus. Other clinical applications of elastography include scanning and for liver fibrosis in portal hypertension, where non-invasive methods for liver stiffness and spleen stiffness have been done, breast cancer for non-invasive screening, thyroid nodule assessment, and in renal fibrosis for CKD, but more interestingly for interstitial fibrosis in allograft kidneys, which may ultimately replace biopsy. Thank you for your patient listening.